I'm Councilmember Carlina Rivera, Chair of the Committee on Cultural Affairs, Libraries, and International Intergroup Relations. Welcome to our oversight hearing. Where are New York City's artists and residents? In addition, today the committee will hear resolution number 74-2024, recognizing April 17th annually as Giovanni the Verrazano Day in the City of New York, sponsored by Councilmember David Carr. Now I'm going to call on Councilmember Carr to make a brief statement about his resolution. Thank you, Chair Rivera. Thank you for having this hearing and, and for hearing uh, this resolution today. Uh, Giovanni de Verrazano is a figure of great significance to New Yorkers of Italian descent. Um, the, the community in the 20th century was looking to name um, a major landmark in the city uh, after one of its own that would represent uh, the significant contributions and presence of the Italian American community in the city of New York. And that is what ultimately led to the naming of the Verrazano Narrows Bridge, which connects uh, the boroughs of Staten Island and Brooklyn, and particularly now the two different parts of my district, which span both sides of the bridge. Um, and he continues to be an individual in history who connects Italian Americans to the narrative of American history. Um, by sailing into New York Harbor, he was the first European to reach uh, New York. Um, and from their perspective, to have discovered it, of course, we know that's not the quite way to phrase it today, but nevertheless, it was a, a landmark moment um, in what ultimately became the American story. And April 17th is the day that he first sailed into the harbor. And so we are looking to recognize April 17th annually as Giovanni de Verrazano Day because of uh, the exploration and subsequent settlement um, by individuals uh, who ultimately are the ancestors and forebears of many of us here in New York um, from the uh, 16th century until the present day. Uh, and in particular, uh, this April 17th is the 500th anniversary of that particular voyage, and so we look to acknowledge it and to make it a day of celebration uh, as it intends to be uh, for Italian Americans across the city of New York. And I urge my colleagues to support this resolution, and I thank the chair, of course, for her consideration and support. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> and now for today's oversight hearing, where are New York City's artists and residents? The answer to that question are certainly should be everywhere. We know from our incredible arts and cultural community organizations that artists and residents who are creating and exhibiting or performing their own new works, as well as teaching artists who are bringing arts education activities to so many audiences, are doing their work across the five boroughs in schools, senior centers, libraries, city agencies, botanical gardens, factory spaces, and more. These artists are supported by a variety of public and private funders, including our own Department of Cultural Affairs, the New York State Council on the Arts, and many, many philanthropic organizations to whom all of us are grateful. We're also grateful for the artists and residents who are creating paintings, musical compositions, dances, sculptures, theater pieces, and more, and who are giving us a glimpse of them in galleries, on stages, and in public spaces. As New York City is recognized as the greatest city in the world because of our arts and culture sector, we are grateful to the over 3,500 teaching artists working now to give our youngest New Yorkers in schools and our oldest New Yorkers in senior centers a chance to engage with the arts, either by making art, by exhibiting or performing art, or by appreciating the works of other artists. New York City would not be New York City without all of them. According to the Center for an Urban Future, our city is home to more artists than ever, with tens of thousands of them here and so many hungry for an opportunity to create and share their talents across generations. Today, we look forward to learning more about the programs that work with our youngest and oldest New Yorkers and everyone in between. We hope to hear about the impact of CASA programs which operate in our public schools and after school hours and about the SU CASA programs which operate in our senior centers. Impactful artist programs like that of the Bronx Arts Ensemble, a nonprofit who saw their budget cut this past year, adversely affecting their ability to support the professional teaching artists who provide arts education courses in more than 40 public schools in the Bronx every year. These residencies, which last either the full school year or one semester, provide public school students with free of charge classes in music, dance, visual arts, theater, and musical theater. Great musical organizations like the Louis Armstrong House Museum, 
which offers the Armstrong Now, now Artists in Residence program to provide established and emerging artists with a platform for creating new work inspired by the artifacts and documents in the Armstrong archives. Artists in Residence spend time at the museum for an intensive period of research and rehearsal and then present a public performance of their work at the museum. And a previous Armstrong uh, Now Artists in Residence was the Grammy Award winning artist Esperanza Spaulding. I am thankful to these organizations as well as the Association for the Development of Vocal Artistry and Neighborhood Culture in Rip Richmond, also known as Moore Opera, to Wave Hill, to the Greenwood Cemetery, the Snug Harbor Cultural Center and Botanical Garden, the International Studio and Curatorial Program and Lincoln Center, who provided a number of fantastic examples of the work of their artists and it's mentioned in our briefing paper provided for this committee hearing. And let me just say one final word about the Public Artists in Residence or PAIR program, which I know we will hear about from the administration. It embeds artists in our own city agencies. It started in 2015, and the PAIR program uses artists to tackle civic issues in creative ways. DCLA works together with each selected city agency to choose a focus for the arts project and then to choose an artist for the project. Uh, three or four artists uh, partner with agencies every year, and in the past that's included Health and Hospitals, Department of Sanitation, Commission on Human Rights, just to name a few. And these agencies, all of whom serve New Yorkers, have benefited from the creative insights of our city artists. And to just give one example, John Carlo Valentine and the City Office for the Prevention of Hate Crimes uh, was a partnership. Valentine, a photographer and writer, worked with OPHC, that's the Office of, for the Prevention of Hate Crimes, to find creative ways to tell the stories of black transgender and gender non-conforming individuals in New York City, including what their needs were and what they faced. Valentine noted that he hoped that folks would feel a sense of prejudice or confusion around the realities faced by transgender and gender non-conforming people will be moved to educate themselves and show up for their community. It's our hope that our city also continues to follow this same mission and motivation and support the work of artists. Through funding and creative partnership, we can remain a place where art, civic engagement, and expression can live harmoniously, even in the unlikeliest of spaces. Now I want to acknowledge my colleagues on the committee who are present. Uh, Ang, who has joined us remotely, Lewis, Carr, Hanks, and Ose. I want to also thank the committee staff uh, who put together this hearing, um, my own staff, just incredible people, and everyone who is here to testify. And just a reminder, if you'd like to testify, please fill out a slip with the sergeant at arms um, and make sure that uh, we have your name and state your name prior to your testimony for the record. And we're ready to start with the panel of DCLA administrators. Christina, please swear them in. Hi, good morning. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. I do. Thank you. You may begin when ready. Good morning, Chair Rivera and members of the committee. I am Alton Murray, Deputy Commissioner at the Depart New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, here to testify on today's topic. Where are NYC artists in residence? I am joined by several of my colleagues here today. Lance Povey, our general counsel, and Ryan Max, our chief of our external affairs director. Artists are the lifeblood of New York City, and we are committed to making sure they can continue to live and work here. We gain so much from being a place where art isn't just presented, but actually made. We attract artists from across the world, and our city is much stronger for it. We also recognize that the ongoing affordability crisis threatened our status as a global arts hub. That's why we are pushing for a records level of affordable housing. The Adams administration financed a record number of affordable homes last year, alongside other supports for working people, including artists. That will keep New York City at the forefront of the global arts community. These efforts include the mayor's City of Yes for Housing Opportunity Proposal, which will help build a little bit of housing across the entire city, a big step towards addressing our housing and affordability crisis. Working with groups like the Entertainment Community Fund, Art Bill, and EDC, 
We also support efforts to get artists into affordable housing while creating affordable artist workspace. On top of this, DCLA remains the largest supporter of arts and culture in America. Just last month, we announced over $52 million in grants for approximately 1,031 cultural groups. These groups put artists to work in communities across the five boroughs. This includes nearly $3 million in support of local arts council that, in turn, provide funding to individual artists and collective. In spite of the fiscal crisis we face as a city, we are proud of this ongoing investment in our artists and arts community. While we support artists in many ways, artists' residencies are particularly powerful, a powerful way that organizations and institutions can enter into a mutually supportive relationship with artists. Artists need space and resources, and resources to do their work, and depending on the nature of the residency or fellowship, artists can also contribute their unique skills and ways of seeing the world. DCLA Public Artists in Res Residency Program, or PEER, is one example of the latter. PEER was established, as you said, um, Chair Rivera, in 2015, when we placed the inaugural artist in the Mayor Office of Immigrant Affairs. There, artist Tiana Bouguera explore ways of building trust for the new IDNYC program within immigrants, within the immigrants and undocumented residents community. The model and idea for PEAR, though, stretched back to 1977 when artist Mariel Eucalese began working as artist in residency with the New York City Department of Sanitation. She would serve in that role for several decades. Some of the projects she created there remain landmark for performance art. For example, in Touch Sanitation, Ms. Yukili shook the hands of over 8,000 DSNY employees, telling each of them in the process, thank you for keeping New York City alive. In the process, she radically reframed the sanitation workers' labor and increased the visibility and dignity of their work in the eyes of their fellow residents. In 2021, we placed the first pair artist with the sanitation department since Ms. Eucalyse. Then artist Stowe Len, working there over the next two years, he built on Ms. Eucalyse's work diving into the department archive and exploring the often underappreciated work it performed for our city. He reactivated a decade-old print shop and digitized decades-old archival videos, all under the banner of his Office of Invisibility. Len is now engaged in an resi artist residency in the Queen's Botanical Garden, showing how these Creative collaborations can lead to greater cr cross-pollination within our cultural community. Literally, Land Project at QBG is a durational exhibition that will grow and respond to the seasonal transformation occurring at the garden. Since 2015, we've placed 24 artists in residencies within 21 agencies. Most recently, we had artists working with DDC, Department of Homeless Services, and Health and Hospital. I attended the unveiling of a permanent new mur mural at Lincoln Hospital, created as part of our peer artist Modesto Flaco Jimenez broader residency with the Department of Health and Hospital. Flaco worked with Health and Hospital Guns Down Life Up program to give its youth participa participant creative outlet to express themselves. This was followed by a showcase at Carnegie Hall last year, which demonstrated the many principles and projects that Flacco Young collaborators created. Another public art in residency residence is Yasmani Abadola, Abaleda. He embedded in he was embedded in the City Civic Engagement Commission in 2021, shortly after the office was created. This meant that CEC integrated an artist's perspective in the foundation of their work and the results have been remarkable. They created the People's Bus, a former Department of Correction bus that Mr. Abeleda transformed into a community center and arts hub on wheels. Artist-driven festival and design are also at the center of their public engagement effort. All thanks to the openness and integrating artists into our work from the ground floor. 
The pair model is often being adopted by other cities. Los Angeles Creative Strategies Program, for instance, place artists, art administrators, and other creative workers in local government agency. At Materials for the Art, DCLA beloved created reuse program, artists in residence have become a powerful way that we give artists financial aid, materials, and free space. MFTA Artists in Residence program was founded in 2012. Since its inception, the program has showcased a remarkable diversity of artwork that can be made through repurposed material that might otherwise be thrown into landfills. Over the years, MFTA has welcomed 27 resident artists to share their innovative work, which is displayed prominently in the MFTA gallery at the end of their residency. Their artwork serves as inspiration to the thousands of organizations, teachers, students, and members of the public passing through, illustrating the transformative potential of MFTA supplies. Building on the success of Artist Residency Program, in 2023, MFTA proudly introduced the Designer in Residence Program, which support emerging designers by providing them with studio space, a stipend, and a platform to exhibit their work. This month, MFTA launched a call for visual artists in residence offering young designers unlimited access to MS. Through DCLA Cultural Development Fund and Cultural Institution Group, we also support residency in all shapes and sizes across the city. Ten illustrative ex Here are 10 illustrative examples. Established in 1776, Brooklyn Du Denay is the leading nonprofit dedicated to artists using the, using the process of hand paper making. Their residency program include the workspace residency serving emerging artists and the lab grant residency serving mid-career artists. Excuse me, 1976, thank you. Thank you, Lance. The Apollo Master Artists in Residence Program engage artists for a three-year period, three period to produce, present, and create new work and events to support emerging and established artists of color. International, the International Studio and Curatorial Program, one that I personally experienced, is a subsidized studio program developed specifically for emerging and early career artists based in New York City. The program offers workspace and professional development for seven artists each year for, one, for a one-year residence, with the option to renew for a second year. The program takes place in tandem with ISCP acclaimed International Residency Program. Through La Mama's Residency Grant, artists' residents are given time, space, and resources to make work creative tools and format at the intersection of online and live theater. These artists present the past, present, and future, future of this pioneering organization. Residency Unlimited provide residence for local artists from underserved community via the 2023 Voices of Multiplicity and 2024 New York City Artist Residency Program. Studio Museum in Harlem Artists in Residence Program give emerging artists of African and Afro-Latinx descent an opportunity to develop their practice in an 11-month residency. The program has incubated some of the most acclaimed artists of our time, including Jordan Castile, David Harmons, Simone Lee, Kerry James Marshall, Micheline Thomas, and Kende Wiley. While the Studio Museum new home is being built, they have continued their artist in residency program in partnership with MoMA and PS1. Here you can currently see the latest cohort work on view. AIM Fellowship, established in 1980, is the museum flagship artist development program. It provides resources to guide emerging artists through the often challenging professional practices of the art world. Since its formation, since forming, the AIM Fellowship has provided pivotal career support to a diverse roster of over 1,200 of New York's most promising artists. Snug Harbor on Staten Island have the Performing Arts Saloon Saturdays. Artist Residence and Performance Program 
which supports creation and development of new work in dance, music, theater, and multidisciplinary performance. Weeksville Heritage Center Artists in Residence program connects work in artists from the African diaspora to the history and culture of Weeksville. It leverages the organization on to Fly Road House as a site for, of inspiration, creation, and exhibition for work that speaks to the present and help makes Weeksville history relevant and re renaissance. The public theater has a wide range of residency fellowship and other programs that support writers, musicians, and multidisciplinary performance artists in the creation of their work. This includes a partnership with the Brooklyn College, with Brooklyn College that grants time, space, and resources to both professional artists and CUNY theater students. A social just, justice playwright in residence program that supports women, femme, and bi non-binary scholar playwrights of the African diaspora through a two-year engagement and more. With the City Council on the Cultural After School Adventurous Program and Sukasa programs. This year, the city is investing more than 21 million in supporting artists and arts organizations that work with students and seniors throughout the New York City area. Last year, New York Times ran a story with the headline, The Changing Role of Artists in Residence. To, to back its claim that arts institutions are moving away from residency programs that support artists in seclusion and towards those that engage with their communities, they led with the Queens, with Queens Museum, where an artist was preparing for a show that was culminating for two years of residency work, deeply rooted in the museum engagement in the neighborhood of Corona, Queens. The residencies we support across the city and our own PEER and MFTA residency program reflects this broader trend. Supporting artists does not mean giving them clustered space away from secluded space away from society. Increasingly, it's a way to get closer to your community. I appreciate the opportunity to testify today on this topic, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. And, and mentioning uh, the article in the Times, uh, I think that was last April, and it said there, I think very clearly, like most artists recognize the significance of, of interaction for their own careers. And I know many of our arts and culture institutions are, are doing that. There are these incredible programs uh, currently implemented. I think for many of the council members, why we're so interested in supporting our artists is because not only do we think it's a, it's a mandate by the city, but it is becoming such an increasingly unaffordable place to live that we want to continue to attract talent. And so whether it's housing as that major barrier, ensuring that we have programs that provide that lifeline, that offer stipends, of course, money, paid uh, opportunities, but also mentorship. I know their programs really do vary very differently, not just across the city, but across the country. Some that provide childcare, just, just very sort of interesting creative aspects of these programs that I think we can learn from. So I just want to, again, thank you for uh, your testimony. How many artists in residence or teaching artist programs does DCLA fund, either directly or through the Cultural Development Fund? And do you have an approximation of how much funding that is in direct funding and in CDF grants? We, so we recognize the value of arts and arts group um, and the importance to our economy. Unfortunately, we do not have the financial quantified number of the investment. However, we do know that 450 CDF grantees provide direct service to New York City public schools. This, in turn, employed hundreds of teaching artists. Um, approximately 320 um, art organizations indicate that they provide cultural program to people with disability, and another 230 indicated no, that they provide programming to people with disability, and 320 indicated that they provide professional development program. So we do not have the actual quantifiable figures, but we know anecdotally that artists who are working 
for arts organizations that we support are providing the services that we are mandating. Have you considered putting together the, the number of programs as a data point at the very least? We, we would certainly entertain that. It, it, we do think that it would be onerous on our nonprofit partners because they will have to break down and quantify the data and it would be a challenge for them, but we would definitely entertain and look into that. I mean, I, I appreciate what you're saying. The last thing we want to do for our nonprofits is make any more sort of administrative or cumbersome responsibilities. I get that. I, I worked at a nonprofit for many years before becoming the councilwoman. Um, I also think it's just recognition for them. They, they know the work that they're doing. They know exactly what happened you know, when those cuts came down. Understood. And they know exactly what was affected. So in that way, it, it could be an interesting exercise. But I always appreciate that you check in with them first before asking them to do anything um, in addition. Yeah, we were looking to that. Thank you. According to DCLA's 2019 action plan, DCLA supports new pair projects annually with various city agencies and offices to uh, develop creative solutions to civic challenges. Mm -hmm. How does DCLA choose the city agencies to work with and which city agencies, well, I said have been chosen in the past, but you actually went through quite, uh, we went through quite a few of them between yeah. our own testimonies. So how do you choose which agencies uh, to work with and how do you choose the civic challenges that have been a focus in the past? So this starts with an open call from our commissioner to all agencies. Um, the artists then respond through an open call and the artists then submit statements, work that they've done, and then we try to pair them with the agencies. It's a mutual beneficial relationship where agency have to express an interest in hosting the artists and then our agency through our public art employees evaluate the right each agency with artists and to implement the program. Or you work with now? We're open to it, but it's also the agency have to express an interest. When we put out an open call, the agency also have to match and express an interest. Uh, does DCLA or any other agency keep track of how much funding comes into the city because of its international artists and residence programs? Unfortunately, it goes back to the question we do not because we think it would be onerous on our partners to gather that information, but also we would be willing to explore that possibility. Uh, do you have any information on, on some of the work you're doing with International Artists in Residence programs? We will get back to you on that. Uh, currently, we do not. Does DCLA or any other agency keep track of where emerging, emerging artists are living and working in the city, and do you believe that emerging artists are now or could be a stabilizing force in underserved communities. You mentioned housing a little bit off, uh, on the top of your testimony, but it was very brief. Yeah. Yes, they, they can be a stabilizing force, but no, we do not have the factual information of where they are. We do know that they work for arts organizations that are throughout the city, and they, most of our artists and teaching artists still do live in New York City. Okay. Okay. I think um, the, the push, I know certainly in my own community, and there's been examples of it in, in El Barrio, you have these creative spaces where there's performance uh, space, but also actual artist housing. And I realize that artist housing is also an interesting sort of legal discussion in terms of preferences, but I do feel like a push there is especially important and certainly something that the city should be looking into. Um, I know in my own community we have some ideas, it's not easy, but again, just to get back to the, the, the spirit of this city and, and how we have to keep as much talent here as possible, considering it's so unaffordable at the moment. Um, I wanna recognize we've been jo joined by Council Member Hudson. And actually, I'm going to go to council member questions, if that's OK, mm -hmm. uh, council member Ose. Thank you, and good afternoon. Good morning. Well, um, I have a couple questions that I want to ask. Uh, the first is to start off with artists of color, in, in particular, black artists are often not given the same opportunities and visibilities, as you know and shared in your testimony, as white artists. Um, how is DCLA working to bring more black artists and artists of color into these residencies, say, like the, the public theater, um, as well as some of the larger cultural institutions? So most of the residencies 
are in underserved communities. And from my own personal experience, most of the artists are artists of color. For example, um, Flacco's um, Guns, uh, Guns Down Life Up project, um, the artist was of Latinx um, descent. He worked with in communities of colors to give young people an opportunity to express their lives, which in turn ended with a mural that was created with the artists and the students, and it was installed at Lincoln Hospital in the Bronx, followed by a project with the same students from underserved communities at Carnegie Hall. This program allowed not just artists to practice their craft, it allowed students from underserved community to contribute to this project. Um, I saw another exhibition that, an installation that was done by Cameron Neal. He was an artist that was at the Department of Records. His project looked at film that was recently declassified, which led to our current surveillance society. And his work was installed in Sunset Park, and then it was installed at Lincoln Center. This allowed the opportunity for communities, different communities, to experience the work, to engage in the conversation. So it's important to stress that we do put a lot of emphasis on mm -hmm. making sure that the artist's statement, the work the artist is interested in doing, mm -hmm. relates to the current situations and challenges that we have in the city. So can you go more in depth into how DCLA is, is making uh, that connection between, you know, said artist and whatever institution or project that, that they're working on, uh, maybe what the outreach prog prog process looks like, um, how these, these individuals are found to be brought into to some of these projects? So there's an open call for artists, and they have to submit their artist statement and samples of their work. Then there is an interest, the agency express an interest. Then we match the open call with the agent, agency, and we look at the applications to figure out what subject matter are of interest to the city as a whole, and then we pair the artists with the agency, and they have to embed themselves in New York City because they spend about three months working within the agency to fully understand the workings of the agency and the community they are going to serve. Is DCLA doing any uh, partnership or outreach work with CUNY on, on getting young students involved within New York City who uh, work in the arts on you know, joining some of these residency programs? So our work with CUNY comes through our CUNY Cultural Core program, but the Artists in Residency is a different program. It's really for professional working artists okay. who truly have an understanding sure. of their mission. Mm -hmm. Um, those are all my questions for now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So do you have plans to expand support for the existing artists in residence or teaching artist programs? So we fund organizations that apply for funding. So we are hoping that with the council's help, we can reach more programs that are offering arts education in schools, whereby we will then have more support for teaching artists. Um, pertaining to the peer program, we are always open to the idea, but it's a partnership. Agencies have to express an interest, and so then we can do the match. Well, I think the agencies are one, one part of the work. I think the the partnership with the community-based organizations. They're the ones who are experts in like outreach and cultivation and professional development. And I, I, you should certainly work with the council because we do know our districts very, very well. But you know, your organization does have the lion's share of the funding. And so you mentioned in your testimony over a thousand organizations were funded and we know that that was an interesting process this year, but, but, but these organizations did receive it. Um, are there barriers to providing support to these programs? If, if so, what are they? There can always be more outreach. We can do more outreach on our part. The council can do more outreach on their part. Borough President's office can do more outreach. So the barrier would be getting the word out, and we look forward to partnering with the council, with Borough President's office, um, with the administration to get more interest from underserved communities. When you say getting the word out, do you have programs that are that are not necessarily being filled? I mean, I, I feel like 
the programs, a lot of them are at capacity and there's, there's a lot of room there for expansion, even in the pair program, right? It's three to four agencies. Even if it's that the agencies are the ones that have to respond, there are certainly other programs I feel that, that can be expanded to support more artists. So you mentioned uh, outreach and, and what the council can do. Our initiatives are very, very limited okay. um, in terms of the council work. So what do you mean by, by getting the word out? What we mean by getting the word out is that the more applicants who have artist residencies to our CDF program, the more organizations that do artist residencies that we'll be able to fund. So if there are artist residencies out there that are not applying, if we expand the pool of applicants who do artist residency work, more of them will get funded. So that's what we mean by increased outreach. If we have more of those programs in our candidate pool, then we can fund more of those organizations. Uh, we've been joined by Council Member Hanif. How do you anticipate that city budget cuts in the immediate future will affect your ability to support artists in residence or teaching artist programs? The city has done a very good job at stewarding the budget cuts. We anticipate that we will be able to ramp up our program and be at full throttle the way we were previous to the pegs. Do you think, uh, you're still discussing restoration of the fiscal year 24 budget cuts, correct? Yes. Excellent. Um, actually, Council Member Hanif, do you want to ask a question? Yeah, okay, I got you. The action plan also imagined that teaching artists should be provided with professional development along with certified arts educators in order to expand access to arts education for multilingual learners and students with disabilities. How many teaching artists have been provided with this professional development? So approximately 320 of our partners, nonprofit partners, indicate that they do provide teaching artists opportunities, which is a form of professional development training. So they provide, is, you said 320? Yes, 320 of our nonprofits. And they hire many, many teaching artists, so it's, you know, it expands that way. And another aspect to that question, council member, is that we're really proud of the work that MFTA does with respect to training New York City school teachers to do arts education in their schools. So they do free programs at MFTA to help train public school teachers to then do more innovative arts programming in their schools and to give them the free supplies to do it. We, uh, this has come up um, many times in the council, especially now in budget season, and ensuring that our schools have you know, enough artists. And I know it, it varies across the school systems, and many times they're reliant on the artists that teach, that are associated with CASA and SUCASA. Uh, so while I think the DOE in the preliminary budget hearing said that it was probably like 90% of schools had some sort of artist within the facilities themselves, uh, a lot of it is part-time. So uh, as, as great as that is and, and the number, the statistic that the chancellor gave was great, but we know it's very minimal and it could be maybe 60 minutes to only one class at a time. Absolutely. So what other plans does DCLA have to expand teaching artist program to be more expansive in their outreach specifically to multilingual learners and students with disabilities? So we plan to encourage and do outreach to underserved communities, to encourage to find new partnerships and new nonprofits who can fill these gaps. All right, so, so something that I, I've asked, you know what, I'll save this question for, for afterwards. I will go to Council Member Hanif. Thank you, Chair Rivera, and thank you so much for being here. Um, I'd like to know uh, how DCLA is incubating Asian and South Asian uh, artists and residents and what you're noticing are the barriers or obstacles in bringing in um, or recruiting this community of artists? So understanding the Asian Asian American community is important to us. Um, a few years ago one of our Asian American artists had a really wonderful campaign at the height of Asian hate. She worked in the CDC office, CEC office, mm -hmm. where she created Stop Asian Hate campaign. And you might have seen them. On Absolutely, the, it's so a that brilliant is the kind campaign. of project that we encourage and support, and that came out of our peer program. And so, our is DCLA working on expanding that work, or how are we making sure that this is this community is not left out, or that there's more work being done to 
really support this community of work because oftentimes what, what I, I witness in my community um, uh, as one of the few South Asians elected in office um, and of course uh, from a community that is often insular and uh, doesn't promote or is or stigmatizes the arts and culture as a, as a, a, a career opportunity. Mm -hmm. uh, we want to be able to encourage the arts and um, in a household where my sister uh, was an artist and m our parents did not encourage the arts as a path, mm. um, it's important for me to see our, our city services and agencies have those opportunities um, and uh, encourage pathways uh, to be able to seek um, artists and residents. And I see that uh, the work with Art Built is mentioned here in your testimony. Art Built is a critical organization in my district, particularly in Kensington, which is a, a, a dense Bangladeshi working class community. And they've done incredible work over the last decade um, to support uh, Bangladeshi youth um, in, their, in their mobile studio. Um, to, to do incredible artwork and poetry class, from poetry classes to making kites, um, to doing multilingual uh, work and, and so much more. So would love to just hear and, and be involved in anything that entails uh, specifically the Asian and South Asian community. Yeah. So we, we have to go to unusual places to find those artists who are doing special work that are not on the radar. Just to give you um, an anecdotal story, uh, last week I went to a choral gathering and there was a gentleman of Southeast Asian descent by way of Guyana. Mm -hmm. And he is working on a film festival. Um, and he was not aware that there are opportunities for him, his festival, even though he's not a nonprofit, he's an independent artist, he was not aware that he can apply to the Arts Council sure. of Queens to get funding and resources for his film festival. So having those conversations in unusual places and going where artists are not in the traditional webinars and, and community um, meetings is where we will find new projects and highlight the work that we are trying to do in, on, in, in underserved communities. That's really wonderful and I'd love to have um, those resources as well so that we can share it out from okay. among our offices. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, to the council member. Um, are any of the artists in residence or teaching artist programs that you fund also supported by any private corporate or philanthropic funding? Because our dollars only go so far, I can say I went to ISCP um, for a site visit a few months ago, and they have a list, uh, a board list of their other funders. So our funding does help, but a lot of independent residencies depend on other funders and funding source to continue to maintain the program. So you uh, work cooperatively with any private funders to support some of these programs that we're discussing today. It's a requirement for all of our CDF grantees that DCLA funding cannot support 100% of any project. So for any CDF grantee, it's a requirement that they need to go out to private philanthropy, corporate donors, foundations to find additional support. Um, so for any of the 450 organizations that Deputy Commissioner Murray mentioned earlier, they are inherently having to go out and find partners for a percentage of that funding. So what is the role that you, you all are playing in assisting them? I only ask because recently I met with the, the deputy mayor and, and her team and because of the cuts that have transpired, some of the, I guess, strategy is to see how we can help organizations get to the Mellons and the New York Community Trusts. That, that, those were specifically mentioned because clearly you know, they're large, they're established. But even if that were to happen tomorrow, you know, even if every single community-based organization and nonprofit figured out a way to not just engage with but also secure private funding, I mean, there's still the loss that has happened over the past few months and, and especially this, this fiscal year in terms of how their budgets have been affected. 
So are you, are you actively having conversations with philanthropy, with private funders? Are you working with community-based organizations to help them sort of navigate what could be you know, a difficult situation? So we have advised um, nonprofits on an individual basis on, on point them in directions for source of funding. One of the things that our grant does is it does give legitimacy to the organization because having a DCLA grant certify that you are a worthy of organization when you go to philanthropic um, partners looking for additional funding. I agree. I think the grant certainly gives uh, a, another source of credibility, but you, in order to uh, qualify for it, you have to show that you're also seeking private funding, right? So it's kind of an interesting cycle. Do you mm. think that public, uh, that private or other public revenue streams could be increased to cover the loss of city funds? As any good corporate citizen would be more than willing to part participate and partner. Arts and culture is such a vital part of New York economic system that we need private-public partnership for all these programs to survive. As we deal with our financial crisis, it's incumbent that private partners, whether it's foundation or corporation, step up to continue to make sure that New York City is a hub for creativity and innovation. I agree, I think we do need uh, private partnerships to, to assist, but what is the city doing about that? We are always willing to explore convenings and we're talking to individual organizations. We've had conversations with other foundations about the possibility, but nothing has matured into a full commitment. I mean, I think, I think what I've heard from, from many cultural organizations and institutions is unfortunately they, they have a, this feeling that, you know, the city thinks that they're going to be okay, they're going to, it's all going to work out, that private funding is going to come through, but they've actually seen a lot of private funding and philanthropy almost walk away from the sector. And so that's been incredibly difficult for them to face. So I feel like um, as much as the city can be doing, I don't know if it's the mayor's fund, whatever it is, it, there really have to be some, I guess, you know, pun intended, creative solutions here because we all agree it's the lifeline, it's the vibrancy, it's what attracts everyone. But you know, we, we had organizations that were zeroed out by the city as well. So that, that is a really, really hard blow. And I know that we're discussing restoration potentially and, and hopefully at some point expansion. But these artists in residence programs, I mean, these are incredible individuals that, as you know, not only have careers when they walk into these residencies, but they will go on to establish them because of some of the credibility that New York City has lent them in, in offering them these opportunities. So um, is, is DCLA doing anything specifically to ensure that artists can continue to live and work in New York City? And what did Create NYC say about this issue, the affordability issue? So we are funding as many organizations as we can. We are very much aware that there is a challenge. We, it's, an it's a perfect storm, right? Corporations are moving away from funding the arts. We are faced with financial you know, challenges. So we continue to have dialogue with, with nonprofits. We continue to have dialogue with, foundation, with our foundation friends. We continue to search for a solution. Um, there isn't anything that we have permanently locked down, but the conversations are ongoing. Sorry, they're ongoing about what exactly, though? Like, what are, what are we doing to ensure that artists can continue to live and work here? Because Create NYC, we, we, you know, that was a, a, a huge initiative. So are there things that you're taking from there and trying to push forward in terms of conversations and initiatives? In terms of the affordability crisis, what we're doing for artists? I, I, will, I, I, I will get back to you on that. Okay. There's nothing I can point All right, to well, well, lastly, I mean, you mentioned uh, outreach, but how could the, the city council better support this work? Just getting Been the word the out. limited, our Re limitations. Yeah. Okay. Um, raising awareness of the work that we're doing every chance you get. Um, inviting us to participate, 
in your community hearings, meetings, um, bring into our attention organizations that are worthy. Um, just being in partnership with DCLA, um, there's not enough stress that you can, enough that I can stress. It comes from outreach, engagement, and finding those funding deserts that we are not aware of. So it, it will take a collaboration on our part, on the council part, and the local borough presidents so that we can find the, the artists and arts organizations that are not on our radar. Okay, well I'm, I do feel like you're going to hear, there are going to be some organizations testifying. They've submitted testimony. Um, many of them uh, are certainly worthy and um, should be considered uh, you know, for restoration, for expansion. I do feel like um, it's such an important time right now in terms of the recovery, the, the return on the city's investment, as you know, is nine, 99 to one in terms of how much money the city funds these cultural organizations and groups. And supporting the artists specifically, I feel, um, uh, is, is everything. So I don't really have any more questions. I know you're gonna get back to me on a couple of items, which I'm looking forward to, and of course, always working closely with the nonprofits and community-based organizations to ensure that we're asking the right things of them and you know, not, not putting too much on them in terms of administrative or, 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 or cumbersome responsibilities, but they do have all these incredible stories and, and anecdotes and data, and I know you've seen it over and over again, but, but I can't stress enough uh, how important they are to the fabric and, and the culture of, of New York City. I 100% agree. We, we do hear a lot of stories, especially our program officers, who are talking to our grantees on a continuous basis, whether it's how to craft a better application or what went wrong this time, and they hear the challenges every day. We are investing in this community, not just financially, but our time, and we are all in this together to find a solution as we struggle with corporations leaving the sector, um, higher prices for rent, for, for space, um, lack of space. So it's an ongoing challenge that we will all continue to fight to figure out a way through, through all of it. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very, very much to the administration. I now open the hearing for public testimony. I wanna remind members of the public that this is a formal government proceeding and that decorum shall be observed at all times. As such, members of the public shall remain silent at all times. The witness table is reserved for people who wish to testify. No video recording or photography is allowed from the witness table. Further, members of the public may not present audio or video recording as testimony, but may submit transcripts of such recordings to the Sergeant at Arms for inclusion in the hearing record. If you wish to speak at today's hearing, please fill out an appearance card with the Sergeant at Arms and wait to be recognized. When recognized, you will have two minutes to speak on today's hearing topic, where are New York City's artists in residence? If you have a written statement or additional written testimony you wish to submit for the record, please provide a copy of that testimony to the Sergeant at Arms. Christina, if you will, please call the first panel. Okay, so for we're gonna start with in-person panelists. Please come up to the table once your name has been called. And our first panel will be Regina Bain, Tiva Baloy, Susan Hapgood, and Jessica Vodur. Yes, you may begin when you're ready. Thank you, Regina. Hello, there we are. 
Hello, I'm Regina Bain, Executive Director of the Louis Armstrong House Museum in Corona, Queens. In 2020, we invited a group of leading artists into the house and archives to reflect. The result was the creation of 27 original works of music, poetry, dance, and film inspired by one of the greatest artists of all time. Four seasons later, the Armstrong Now Artist in Residence program deepens, contextualizing Armstrong within constellations of black making, thinking, and vitality. The residency provides both established and emerging artists with a stipend and a platform to create new work inspired by the vast collections of the Armstrong archives. Artists spend time at the museum for an intensive period of research and rehearsal, presenting a public performance at the museum and often beyond. Last year, a signature Armstrong Now project brought open rehearsals to students from the Summer Youth Employment Program, a free performance in the Armstrong Garden for hundreds of our neighbors, a performance at the Newport Jazz Festival for thousands, and then back to New York for a premiere at the Jazz at Lincoln Center, and now back to Queens College at the Kupferberg Center all of which was incubated on 107th Street in Queens. We love to shout the names of our artists and collaborators. They include Amira Leone, Antonio Brown, Matthew Whitaker, Alan Latour, Ulysses Owens, Bruce Harris, Marquise Hill, Gibson Gellin, Naomi Extra, Kayla Farish, Christian Sands, Ben Stamper, Jake Goldbass, Daniel J. Watts, and so many more. This is economic, educational and cultural vitality for our community. Thank you to all who support the space and time it requires to help us all reflect on the past so that we can move into the future. Armstrong Now applications are open right now on our website, lewisarmstronghouse.org. See you in Queens. Committee. My name is Tiva Beloy. I am the Education and Public Programs Coordinator at the Greenwood Cemetery in Brooklyn. Thank you for this opportunity to add to the conversation about arts residencies in New York City. Uh, personally, this is my first time speaking to a city council committee, so thank you for giving me this chance. Um, probably goes without saying that an arts residency at the Greenwood Cemetery is among the more unique opportunities for artists in New York City. Um, Greenwood created its Artists in Residency program in 2021, and that year we received over 900 applications. The year-long residency provides one artist in the visual or performing arts with a studio space in one of Greenwood's historic buildings, the landmark Fort Hamilton Gatehouse, and an honorarium to create an installation or performance um, at Greenwood. The artist gets full access to the cemetery's professional staff, archives, and historical collections. They can even speak to the gravediggers if they want to. Um, the whole point is for the artist uh, to be inspired by Greenwood's history, monuments, and environment. And then at the end of their re residency, they produce a site-specific work um, that speaks about and then speaks about their work to the public as part of our programming series. Um, unfortunately, I don't have enough time right now to tell you about all of the great work these artists have been able to produce, um, but each one has gotten a lot of press attention as well as attention from the public. They've expanded their own careers and shared their art with our South Brooklyn community. They've also brought new perspectives and ideas to how we at Greenwood can interpret our own space for the public. We at Greenwood urge the City Council and Department of Cultural Affairs to support the Artist in Residence program at Greenwood and to support all arts residency across all five boroughs. They're great for artists, they're great for New Yorkers, and they're great for expanding the arts in New York City. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Rivera and members of the committee. My name is Jessica baker Vidor, and I'm the President and CEO of the Snug Harbor Cultural Center and Botanical Garden in Staten Island. Uh, we are a member of the Cultural Institutions Group, and we were founded in 1977 as a very expansive place where nature, education, and history unite to bring dynamic programming events and festivals to our diverse community. We welcome nearly 500,000 annual visitors 
However, we found that Staten Island has still the lowest rate of arts participation in our city. And to us, arts and residence programs help us bridge that gap. Um, city Council funding supports our efforts to create a more culturally connected and thriving community. Snug Harbor has received SUCASA funding since 2020, and we've served since that time 423 seniors with this work. Our teacher artists who work with our seniors foster creativity, build community, and reduce isolation amongst our seniors. Snug Harbor's CASA programs combine art with environmental science and can create sustainable school gardens. We have served 247 students with this program since its initiation. Our CASA and Sue CASA programs have supported seven teaching artists with employment on average at $20,680 per year. These programs we feel are eminently replicable and we really would love to have these programs in every single school in Staten Island. Uh, we're very grateful to our council members, uh, David Carr and Camilla Hanks and Majority Leader, Leader Borelli for recognizing the value of these programs in Staten Island to our community. Our baseline funding also supports subsidized studio space for 39 individual artists and companies, including Art Lab School of Fine Arts and Staten Island's Music Conservatory. And we also fund staff time for our past performing arts residency, which is unique in New York City for providing space for artists to live and create and present new work. That's my time. I've sub submitted additional testimony. Thank you for having us today. Good morning, Council Member Rivera and committee members. Thank you for providing the opportunity to testify about artist residencies, a topic at the heart of everything I do. My name is Susan Hapgood and I'm Executive Director of the International Studio and Curatorial Program. Located in an old printing factory in Brooklyn, ISCP, as we're known, is the largest international arts residency program in the country and the fourth largest in the world. We welcome 100 artists every year and our public programs bring over 10,000 visitors annually, mostly New Yorkers. Our ground floor program, which Alton Murray spoke about earlier, offers studios to New York City artists for less than one third of the market rate for a going studio. And to answer your question, the question of this hearing, where are New York City's artists in residence? There are a lot of them at ISCP in East Williamsburg. We are also part of the Rethinking Residencies Working Group of 15 New York City Artists in Residence programs, which produced a book last year, which I've shared with you. Um, there it is. I've shared a few of those with you. It's titled Bringing Worlds Together. Um, and it is a book about arts residencies, so it's totally on topic. As Nova Benway wrote in the book, in a culture where art sales command high prices, yet artists are notoriously undervalued, residencies stand for the importance of supporting not just art, but the people who make it. Our programs are the kindling for New York City's diverse and thriving arts and culture sec sector. ISCP brings in from outside of New York City funding, any government funding, foundation funding, we bring in $750,000 a year from outside of the, of the city. Um, and while galleries and museums are the most visible parts of the arts economy, residencies nurture the creative kernels of new ideas that go on to receive broader recognition. The, uh-oh, um, I will try and be super quick. Um, the best way to make progress on diversity and accessibility goals is to invest at the ground level. We have uh, an NEA grant for artists of color from New York City, as well as a fund for artists from Africa. We deserve more support and rec recognition. Um, kindling, pipelines, catalysts, and seeds, these are all apt metaphors to describe what artists' residencies are to the broader cultural well-being of the city. Thank you. Thank you. If I could just ask, and, and any one of you can, um, you know, offer uh, comments. What's what's been the biggest challenge in in running your programs, and what else could the city do to support these programs, especially given current fiscal constraints? I mean, right, like more funding would be ideal. Let's start. <laughs> let's start there. But. More funding, but I think one of the things that was raised earlier, um, the. Uh, connection to private sources of funding and reaching across the aisle, whatever you call it, to 
introduce us to um, people that in big foundations where we might not have connections would be very helpful. Agreed. And the conversation about housing is very important um, for the, the folks that we work with, the younger artists especially. Um, some of them have said, I was considering leaving the city, and this opportunity gave me a chance to stay um, and, and work to do and expand upon. And so we, we want to offer opportunities um, that provide economic uh, viability for our younger artists. And I saw the, the, the Louis Phillips trial, I saw some of the artists that you went through and I went down such a wonderful like path in, in looking into their work and what they've done and so many are celebrated and all of you are doing such incredible work. Is it, Are your main sources of funding for your program from the city or a, a, a mix? At Snug Harbor, our funding is about 60% from the city, uh, and then the for other 40% made up by private foundations and state support, as well as a small um, contributions from individuals. Um, we yeah, don't please. receive funding from the city, but we do receive about 50,000 from the CDF and the BCLA, and that has to stretch across all of our programming, not just the arts, artist and residency program. Right, I mean, that, that is substantial. I don't know, do any of my colleagues have any questions? Yeah, okay. I'm looking at the artist in residence uh, from Greenwood Cemetery. Yes. Um, you mentioned that there were 900 applicants. There were in 2021. In 2021. Yes. And how many were accepted? Just one. Just one. Yeah, there's just one. Just one out of 900. Yes. Uh, and so that means that 899 were rejected. Um, and so either these folks applied for other, like in other places, and hopefully they got acceptance letters in other art spaces and hubs, um, or they didn't. Yeah. And so could you talk a little bit more about like, what are the, what are the what's the likelihood that they did? Is are, are, like, are we, are we in a place where we can um, affirmatively say that they did or they didn't? Um, that, that's part one of the question. And then, um, <clears throat> Given that there's, like, we're seeing this, like, overflow of applicants, like, is it, is, are we seeing this kind of a, an overflow in most places where applications open up um, when there's a, a, a call for applicants um, in, every, in every hub or space? Like, is the volume of applications um, this many? Well, um, at Greenwood, um, after the first year, we did move to a nomination process for the second um, and third, but we're going back to having an um, open call. So we're hoping that um, this year, um, we're still in the process of selecting. There's an internal um, group that um, reads through all of the statements and um, moves through all the applications. Um, Hopefully there'll be more opportunities across the city um, that can provide something similar. Um, we don't have the ability to um, accommodate more than one artist residency a year. So, um, yeah. I was just gonna say that yes, every opportunity we announce, we get huge numbers of applicants. Um, it's a testament to the quality of the cultural life in this city. Mm -hmm. um, of course, we want to say yes to everybody, but um, we can't. We don't have enough funding to, to accommodate everybody. I would just add that one of the things that uh, we've done at Snug Harbor to try to continue that pool of artist selection to be um, 
representative of the artists who are applying, and I agree, we have generally overwhelming application numbers for the small spots that we have. Um, one of the efforts that we've made is to try to incorporate awarded artists into the next panel selection process. So we invite artists who are, have participated in our residency program to participate with us in the selection of the next cohort. And we've found that that has both grown our numbers um, by getting them to connect us to artists we may not be reaching in our normal advertising process, um, but also you know, hopefully democratizing the process of selecting those artists through our open call as well. Lastly, I'll say uh, definitely the, the search is still on for the artists who are not selected for where they can both um, create as well as simply exist um, and be in their lives. And uh, I will shout out the Cultural Solidarity Fund um, for the work that they did to provide stipends to so many artists during the pandemic and afterward, a collective of organizations and individuals who came together for, the, for that support. Um, thank you for the work of, of artists in residence programs, but also thank you to the work of the Cultural Solidarity Fund um, for, for all of the artists. Well, thank you for uh, shouting them out, the <coughs> Cultural Solidarity Fund. And you know, we take very seriously, right, that connection to private sources that just isn't, doesn't necessarily seem to be accessible, especially equitably, and or even uh, there's there are so many barriers that continue uh, to face, uh, you know, smaller, I would say, organizations, those that represent marginalized communities, black, indigenous uh, organizations run by people of color. There's so many things there, but. I just want to thank you for your testimony. Um, I un also understand, you know, a, a many, a lot of this funding that comes from the city, you all are d dependent on, and I think that's our responsibility to you. That's our duty to your organization, because you provide so much more than, than, than just a, a, a work of art, which is so important. The way you elevate humanity, you bring people in, um, is incredible. So the housing opportunities is something that's very, very important to us. I think that I've said before, the council is laser focused on uh, doing what we can to focus on creation and preservation in order to keep people in their homes and in their community. So, so thank you all for your testimony today and thank you for your work around the city. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Our next panel will be Gonzalo Casals, Jamie Todd, and George Shear. You just need to, well, yeah, sorry about that. Okay, <laughs> can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. okay. Yes. Good morning. My name is Jamie Todd, and I'm a multidisciplinary artist based in Sunnyside, Queens. Like many aspiring artists, I moved to New York City 20 years ago with the dream of a thriving art career. Through persistence and hard work, I managed to show my art in various nonprofits and cultural institutions throughout the city. But in spite of these opportunities, I still felt like I needed the support that would advance my art career, which was especially important to me as a black woman artist. In 2023, I was chosen alongside four other minority artists to be a part of the Artworks Residency Program through the Jamaica Center for Arts and Learning, or JCAL. The goal of the residency was to empower BIPOC artists with the resources and skills to navigate the complexities of the art world. For 10 months, we intended curated seminars with art professionals sharing their expertise in areas including contracts, marketing, intellectual property, and legacy planning. One of my residency mentors even recognized my potential and invited me to participate in the Harlem Fine Art Show, where I sold over $2,000 worth of artwork and made valuable networking contacts. Because JCAL recognizes that artists are the economic and cultural backbone of New York City, they consistently pay them for showcasing their work. The grant funding for my residency allowed me to cover numerous art expenses, including my first art studio, which has been an absolute game changer in my creative development. Programs like Artworks are now endangered by the deep and harmful budget cuts ordered by Mayor Adams to DCLA this year. 
They're especially harmful to communities of color who will be disproportionately suffer, will disproportionately suffer from loss of jobs, which are critical drivers of our economy. I urge Mayor Adams to reverse the $20 million in cuts from this year, and I ask all city council members to refuse to vote on any budget with $15.5 million in cuts for next year. Artworks and I need your support. Thank you for your time. Hello, um, my name is George Shear. I'm the newly appointed executive director of the Elizabeth Foundation for the Arts at 323 West 39th Street in Manhattan. It's a pleasure and honor to present to you this morning. EFA is a 501c3 public charity founded in 1992, serving artists and communities in New York and around the world. At our property, we have 90 artist studios, three galleries, and a historic Robert Blackburn community print workshop whose legacy dates to the Harlem Renaissance. EFA is a unique and increasingly rare gem in Manhattan where whole artists is nurtured. While we provide advanced support for the creation, exhibition, and selling of artwork, our mission focuses on building and sustaining artist communities here in New York. EFA studios offer merit-based juried processes to select New York visual artists to receive two years of subsidized studio with potential for renewal. The artists, this allows artists to anchor themselves in the city and advance their creative and professional careers. Additionally, we further our mission through studio-based residencies for printmakers, international artists, and artists working at New York City cultural institutions. We are proud to be an intergenerational, diverse community working across all 12 floors at all levels of professional development and personal background, supporting each other in the advancement of New York's cultural identity. This creative hive is shared with the community through public programs, exhibitions, performances, open studios, and events. I'm addressing the City Council today to invite you to support the artists and arts organizations of this great city. We are a proud member of the Garment District Alliance, a district that most intensely faces the challenges of economic uncertainty in the commercial real estate market. I'm pleased to say that our studios are fully occupied and in demand. With every economic downturn, the arts are a key ingredient in bringing together public and private partnership that reverse economic trends, catalyze social and market growth, and if done right, support communities in their place. EFA is an actively supporting key strategies of the Creative NYC Cultural Action Plan, preserving long-term affordable artist workspace, supporting employment and professional development, and artists creating public art. I welcome you to join me at Visit EFA, and thank you for your time. Buenos dias, and uh, thank you, Chair Rivera, for allowing me to um, testify today, and thank you, uh, Councilmember Carr and Hanif, for staying and listening to the people. Um, I'm here, um, my name is Gonzalo Casals, and I, along with Mauricio Delfin, I co-direct the Cultural and Arts Policy Institute. A common thread of my career has been to center artists in every project that I have involved, and I'm here today to share some recommendations for expanding and resourcing the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs um, PER program. I'm gonna not make a case for it. It's great when the administration, the council, and the sector is in agreement when a program is great, like this one. And, and there are like um, three, uh, four um, sort of opportunities to improve the program, which is one is to protect artists' intellectual property. Unfortunately, artists working on PAIR, um, they sign off the intellectual property of their work with the city every time they work with the city. Um, that is unique, even when artists sell their work, <coughs> they retain their intellectual property, right? You know, you buy the object, you pay for the experience, the intellectual property always belongs to the artist, and that's, I'm sure, something that can be changed, talking to city law. Then we need to ensure that artists in the per program receive proper compensation, and I'm gonna talk in a minute about the details and how it can be done in a fairly easy way. And then, for sure, we need to expand the resources and support uh, DCLA um, to manage the, um, the program effectively by fostering collaborations um, with other partners outside the city, and I'm gonna speak about those. Um, I don't have to say much more about intellectual property. Um, the beauty of this program that was put brilliantly together by Commissioner Finkerpel is that you use the micro-purchase you know, policy um, to allow um, really quickly for agencies to hire these artists. Agencies can spend only $20,000 without doing a competitive program. So the CLA would give $20,000 to an artist. The hosting, should I keep going? The hosting organization uh, would give another $20,000 and artists would receive $40,000 to work for a year. Unfortunately, $40,000 
if you think of a full-time job, it pays less than living wage. If you calculate it as a part-time job, 20 hours, it's only f less than $30 an hour. And just for reference, um, a teaching artists get 60 hours, $60 an hour per teaching hour. Um, art handlers get 30, right? And again, we're having artists getting paid less than those two other jobs that are service jobs, and they're still giving away the intellectual um, property. However, we can take advantage of the MWB program which allows to do non-competitive purchases up to a million dollars, right? And we can do this, this not only incentivize the pair program to be uh, more equitable, but also would it allow us to spend more money on um, the residency every year that artists do. In doing that, there's a few ways that you can do that. Number one, we can ask artists, and Yasmania Goleda here is an example, to become a, a S Corp. Right, and by doing a SCORP, you can certify as an MWB uh, um, enterprise and be able to um, receive more money from the city with a, not a competitive process. Two is that might be complicated for artists. A third party could be created to be an SCORP and funnel you know, the payments for artists um, from the agencies. And, and the third one, which might take the work <laughs> of the council, is maybe expand the MWB program to allow LLCs, which are very simple to set up, I set up one for my consulting work, and allow them to be certified as an MWE program. Um, <clears throat> and then, of course, DC Lake can not be able to tell you this, but it will be ideal that there will be a, a, a dedicated person in the agency to manage this program, headcount, 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 <laughs> and put pressure on MBA, um, on OMB. And then the last one is, the program has been such a um, success that it doesn't have to be anymore between DCLA and another agency. I'm gonna give you an example of one of the organizations in your um, district. The Artist Alliance, along with, along with City Lord, they have done an amazing research on CIRA and artist employment programs in the 70s, and they're trying to see how we learn from those lessons to create more artist employment in the city. Doris, the Department of Records, has 80 boxes of files about CIDA. It would be great if the two organizations put you know, some money towards an artist residency, along some money from the city, to have an artist go for a year, go over those files, and really uh, help us understand a little bit more how we can change policies around artist employment. Um, that's all, unless you have <laughs> questions. <laughs> I can tell you a little bit about um, artist housing and um, what philanthropy is doing with this. Um, you had questions about Clear NYC and, and also the thriability of artists, um, if you have any questions. Well, the one thing I wanted to, well, thank you for your testimony. Uh, I, I really appreciate it, and I'm very happy to hear, you know, you, you, know, you made like a sale, like you were able to share your art and, um, I wish you many more, as much success as, as you would ever uh, wish and desire. Uh, I think the, the protecting intellectual property part is so interesting. Uh, so I thank you for that recommendation. Proper compensation, expanding sources of support. The fact that the, the money currently, or the stipends currently offered, I know, are, are the most that some organizations can do, but really the math is, can be less than minimum wage. Uh, the S Corp incorporation, the MWBE certification, uh, all of that dedicated person at DCLA for the program, uh, I think are all great recommendations. So I just want to thank you for bringing, you know, solutions to the table. So I will certainly follow up on that. You know, I had read about the program at the Department of Records and I was curious about it. So that was city lore. Um, no, I'm proposing that city lore and, and artist alliance could do that. Um, but again, bringing, you know, City Law and Artists Artis Alliance can raise money, pay for half of the residency, and work directly with Doris, right? And the Doris will pay the other half. I'm saying that we can Im invite yeah, private no, no, partners I think, I to think contribute it's, it's to this. It's very interesting to look at something that worked, you know, decades ago and how we can... Uh, expand it. Yeah, expand it and, and of course tailor it to, to be more modern and, and of our time. So I, I thank you for that, that's, that's great. Um, any, any questions? Well, I will certainly follow up with you on the artist housing because I know you did yeah. a lot of work. 
yeah. and you never say this, but you are, were our former commissioner, and I had <laughs> such a, I had such a, it was such a pleasure working with you, um, and what you've done for my own district and my own community, but also the city. So thank you, and I want to thank this panel for your testimony and for the work that you're doing. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Our next in-person panel will be Yasmani or Boleda and Yelena Keller. We're going to do it as I speak. They're, they know. Thank you. Why not? It's my house. That's fine. You can begin whenever you're ready. You can hear me? Good morning, I'm Yelena Keller, Assistant Curator at the Studio Museum in Harlem. Thank you, Chair Rivera and members of the committee for the opportunity to testify today. Since 1968, the Studio Museum has been recognized for its catalytic role in advancing the work of visual artists of African and Afro-Latinx descent through its iconic Artists in Residence program. Proposed as a founding initiative by artist William T. Williams, the program sits at the heart of an institution centered around artists. The residency program grants three emerging artists, local, national, and international, with an unparalleled opportunity to develop their art practice inside the museum across 11 months, culminating in a public group exhibition. Individuals selected for the residency receive institutional guidance, professional development, research support, studio space, and a stipend of $37,500 paid out over the residency year. Through the financial relief afforded by the stipend, the museum is able to offer artists in residence a period of deepened engagement with their studio practice, away from the commercial demands of the art world at a pivotal point in their careers. Since its founding, the Studio Museum is proud to have supported nearly 150 artists through its Artists in Residence program. As a program geared towards emerging artists, the residency offers a foundational opportunity for creative and professional growth, with many of our past participants becoming some of today's most significant and innovative artists. The program's alumni include recipients of prestigious fellowships and awards from the Guggenheim Foundation, MacArthur Foundation, Paula Krasner Foundation, to name only a few. The demonstrable impact of this residency program on our artists is reflected not only in the various collections stewarding their work or incredible awards and fellowships recognizing their outstanding achievements, but in the fact that some, like Hinde Wiley and Titus Kafar, have gone on to create their own artist-centered residency programs. One of the most remarkable attributes of this program is its commitment to fostering a sense of community and collaboration among residents through public programs, workshops, critical dialogue partners, and studio visits with community organizations and schools, artists have the opportunity to engage with their peers, mentors, and the broader Harlem community, forging connections that transcend artistic boundaries and ignite meaningful conversations. Thank you. Buenos dias. Thank you, Chair Rivera and committee members for allowing me to testify today. My name is Yasmani Arboleda, and I'm a queer Colombian American artist who builds community by inviting people to imagine impossible futures together. In 2020, I was elected as the public artist in residence for the Civic Engagement Commission. The residency is meant to last a year. In the fall of 2021, the CCC and I decided that our work together was too valuable that it needed to continue. I became the inaugural People's Artist for the City of New York in 2022. I continue to my work with the Civic Engagement Commission to this day. I come before you to testify on the impact of the PEAR program has had on the well-being of our New York City communities. In only four years, the Civic Engagement Commission and I have developed numerous projects and initiatives that have engaged hundreds of thousands of New York City residents. I will name three of the most meaningful ones for you today. The People's Bus, a retired C New York City corrections vehicle that has been transformed into a beautiful community center on wheels. 
The People's Bus has spent the last three years traveling across the city in a series of events we often call the People's Festival. In our first summer, we engaged over 10,000 residents across all five boroughs. We employed 148 artists and more than 50 community members. We also created a youth program titled the People's Fellowship that had 27 young people between the ages of 14 and 21 years old. All of these participants were paid $18 to $20 an hour for their labor. In the summer of 2023, we turned the People's Buzz into Tippy, the tender people's money monster, a large-scale puppet, the People's Buzz in drag, that teaches New Yorkers, young and old, about our citywide participatory budgeting program. We engaged over 100,000 residents who voted on what kinds of projects they felt would be most beneficial to their communities. These 46 projects are being implemented now. If I may continue. While the numbers only give you an idea of the scale and impact in engagement and employment, the outcomes of these projects are restoring dignity, unlearning harmful practices, and co-creating meaningful belonging. However, nothing paints a picture more than a story. This year, we're launching the Sunnies. Look like this. And they look a little bit like this. I welcome my colleagues at the Civic Engagement Commission to share what they look like with you all. Um, this is... <laughs> and I just to add, they weren't finished on time, but a few of them are here. Sorry, 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 sorry. we just. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, each council member will be receiving one sunny, that's Shahana sunny, actually, that's being passed around. Uh, but the idea is that each council member will receive an optimistic yellow creature. <laughs> Uh, in the near future, before May 1st. Um, they are making their public appearance for the first time here today. Hundreds of these heartful creatures will begin to appear all over New York City on May 1st. They represent New Yorkers from the future that are modeling for us how to take care of each other. They're optimistic yellow and they are hard forward. That's why we are calling them Sunnies, New York City's Sunshine Sentinels. They're inviting us all to vote on the people's money and engage in participatory democracy through our citywide process. Here's what makes the work so powerful. These sculptures are being crafted by and, and handmade by head of household immigrant mothers. The idea is to provide economic empowerment to families who should be adapting to our city with dignity and not with shame. Thank you for your time and, rec and recognizing the importance of the Artists in Residence program in building a more inclusive and vibrant New York City. I strongly urge a continued investment in the programs, which I, in these programs, which I believe are meaningful and enrich our city in ways nothing else does. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. I, I, I've been on the People's Bus and the Clemente parking lot, um, and it was such, it's on my Instagram, um, but uh, <laughs> it, it, was, it was such a beautiful experience. It was incredible. And you know, the, the, the story and the interaction um, was, was something that was really an unforgettable um, moment. And, and that clearly this one will also go down in the books here. Um, so can you, <coughs> you said that the sculptures are being crafted by head of household immigrant mothers. How did you um, engage these families? How did you find these women? You know, a huge part of it, all of the work that I do is collaboration and interdependence. And so Libertad Guerra, De Clemente, and Andrea Gordillo and others have been supporting how we think about how we connect. Un Local, uh, Aids for Life, we're partnering with organizations that are, are actually creating immigrant integration centers in our public schools on weekends. Yeah. And so many of these organizations have rosters of people who have experienced before. Most people don't know, but there's people who are crossing the border who are lawyers, who are trained in all kinds of capacities. And the more we can understand their skill sets and their history, the more we can actually benefit. For me, these little sculptures, the idea that they'll show up in public space and we'll be able to say immigrants are making them to make our city more beautiful because we belong, makes a statement on, in itself. I, I will also share that the people's money, the participatory budgeting process, really is inclusive of all kinds of challenges throughout our, all of our communities. I believe it's more than 50% of the, of the different ideas that have come forward in that process identify often um, marginalized communities immigrants specifically in support of a more holistic understanding of how we bring well-being to our entire city. And I really appreciate this panel because the, the Afro-Afro-Latino experience and 
ensuring that you know we are uh, supporting that. I, I think they're right away they're very like cheerful and happy, and then to to know that um, you've you know intentionally not just recognized but sought that the people that are coming here not only do they have these incredible backgrounds and and certification and education but that there's such tremendous artistic talent and the 175,000 people that have joined us since you know last spring so enormous opportunity i always say in a state of emergency there's also a state of emergence to recognize that is critical. I will tell you, in my first year as a pair, my budget was $20,000, and it became half a million dollars within four months of trying to tell the story of the People's Buzz and the People's Festival, which directly went to employ artists in communities that need em economic empowerment immediately in, in the present. When I think about the recommendation by DCLA to, uh, to have the, the council focus on awareness, I, I think to myself, awareness doesn't pay the rent, actually. We have to think about economic dis uh, decisions and, and places where we can look at how policy is transforming, where budget lines fall, and how we can really allocate funding in a way that's meaningful and that is tangible so that we can pay the rent and not just try to exist, but thrive in our city. Agreed, agreed. Uh, awareness is great, but I, I agree that we have to pay our artists and we have to ensure that we're funding these programs. So this is. It, this is beautiful. Thank you so much for making our day. I, well, I, don't, I don't know about you, but I'm like, do you want to ask them something? Well, thanks for being here. <laughs> and um, I'm, I'm super excited because um, not only is this um, a beautiful arts experience and it's going to be covered uh, across our city, and I'd love to know um, where exactly in our city um, it'll be focused, but also it's integrating um, civic engagement and it's integrating one of my favorite um, initiatives, participatory budgeting, um, which you know, has taken a kind of like um, backseat in the city council. Um, although participatory budgeting vote week is, is coming up within the city council in April. Um, and I like that the arts is so powerful that um, it can capture civic engagement in such a way that it doesn't need to be uh, shared in words. That it can be, it can be visually explained and visually um, casted. That with just like sculpture or with with just some arts symbolism, um, people, our community can be. Uh, it can be told how to navigate city and city services and share how exactly they want the city to be transformed. Um, so one, where, uh, one, uh, where are the sculptures gonna be? How large are these sculptures? Um, and then um, is there lang like wh what language capacities once people are uh, using the QR codes? And then um, is, is the QR code associated with um, sharing ideas, voting for PB, or getting involved with an organization? I mean, I'm just like now bubbling with ideas of like, are people getting plugged into organizations? I mean, in other cities, um, I know that the, um, like the, the, the similarity with the link the the key the link nyc kiosk or a, a variation of the kiosks that other cities have have like the services that a, a, a person could get involved with is it similar to that um and then how much money is being spent on this and is it uh, is it different from the the cec's um participatory budgeting funding or has that also increased too those are some of my questions. Thank you for all those questions, uh, Council Member Hanif. Um, these little figurines are all gonna be around 10 inches tall. This is their actual size. The idea is that there's more and that they will be all up, all up in places asking us to look up and, and be optimistic. 
Um, they're going to be appearing in partnership with many organizations throughout the five boroughs. Uh, we're thinking about who are the partners who are interested in creating installations. We're thinking that they might be protesting in Union Square. They might be doing in a, a tax, you know, waiting for taxi at Central, uh, you know, in at Grand Central. But really, when I think about the Brooklyn Museum and all these other locations, Prospect Park, there's a collection of them that's going to be gardening throughout the city, so climbing trees. They, they're, there's a collection of them that will be uh, honoring our sanitation workers, thinking through, gosh, who really makes our city and how do we really bring forward their stories. Um, the budget, one of the things that has been an incredible part of my journey as a public artist in residence with the Civic Engagement Commission has been that sitting in rooms with the people who are deciding how to think about budgets. I'll give you the example. Our communications budget this year was $300,000 that was just meant to go to advertising in all the different languages that we, you know, the 11 official languages of New York City, et cetera. And to be able to sit in those rooms and hear, oh, there's money for advertising in this way and, uh, and like communication in, in this way and that's called communications and that's called advertising all of that can be art actually how we think about advertising and art and how often these systems in our agencies oh you just pay for a vendor to do X well those vendors could actually be artists doing the work and so when I sit in the rooms I'm like oh my gosh can we pull from that budget and from that budget how do we think about what's possible and how do we actually mobilize it towards the communities in their hand that can actually benefit from this economic resource and so uh, I think right now the budget for this installation specifically is around $100,000, but it includes also uh, commissioning Mukin Taka, a Brooklyn-based artist collective, to do an inflatable version of them that will be unveiled at some point in May. We also hired the, the Processional Arts Workshop to create two 12, 12, 12 feet tall puppets that will be going on parades throughout May and June. And so the evolution of these yellow creatures and how we invite others to imagine what they are and how hard forward they, ex they exist among us is a super playful journey of investing in artists, investing in communities that should be served financially, and really thinking about how we cross-pollinate across all of these spaces. I hope that told the truth about all the process of, the, of this, but yeah. And then is it connected to, to the PB cycle? Oh yes, yeah. so just to be clear, they are showing up on May 1st because our voting period for the participatory budgeting process is May 1st through June 12th. So for those six, six weeks, they will appear in the middle of the night every so often unexpectedly, surprising New Yorkers as they wake up in the morning in different parks, plazas, and different locations. I welcome the council and anyone who's listening to me to reach out and tell us where should they appear, what should they be doing. If they're modeling how we take care of each other in the future, literally we're making them right now so the hope is to be as participatory as possible and really involve everyone who wants to join us in this movement. When people click on the QR code that will appear next to them, they will be able to vote directly on the projects of the second cycle of the citywide participatory budgeting process, they'll be able to learn which projects are happening in their districts, in their borough, and literally vote as part of the journey. And so the hope is to get as many New Yorkers to vote as possible, but it is entirely about the people's money. And at some point we considered them calling them pennies, but the consensus, we did a participatory voting period for the CEC, and the staff chose to call them sunnies because they're sunshine sentinels. Thank you. Uh, I think we all agree arts and activism have always uh, coexisted and em empowered the other, and that um, it's clearly the foundation for civic engagement. So thank you, that was wonderful, and we're looking forward to, to supporting you all, and, and, and thank you for your work. Muchas gracias. Thank you. That concludes our in-person testimony, and we will now transition to remote testimony. For virtual panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and the sergeant at arms will set the timer and give you the go ahead to begin. Please wait for the sergeant to announce that you may begin before delivering your testimony. Our first virtual panel will be Joseph Rizzi, Angelo Vivolo, and John Gabriel. Joseph, you may begin when the sergeant st starts your clock. Time is starting, you may begin. Yes, good morning. Uh, thank you, Chair Rivera. Can you hear me? Yes, we can, loud and clear. Thank you for being here and for your patience. Yeah, no, no, thank you for giving me, giving me the opportunity to express my feelings. Uh, first of all, thank you and, and the uh, committee for allowing me to speak. And I would like to uh, send a big thank you and appreciation to uh, Councilman David Carr for his initiative this is really something that deserves uh, um, 
a big applause uh, because it's recognizing uh, a person who ventured out in the world that was unknown to uh, a good part of the world at the time. Com we could compare him to uh, Neil Armstrong and the uh, people that made the first landing on the moon uh, going somewhere where they had no idea where they were going to, not even knowing if they were going to make it back uh, alive. Some of them didn't even do that. But they gave a start on um, something that has created the greatest boroughs, Brooklyn and Staten Island, the greatest city, New York City, the greatest state of New York, and the greatest country in the world. So we owe it to this person, Giovanni da Verrazzano, uh, a debt of gratitude for what he did coming to this world and kickstarting um, a great new chapter uh, in the history of the world. So the world will recognize that. The world will thank you for considering this day. And I'm looking forward on behalf of the Federation of Italian American Organization of Brooklyn, and I am Joseph Frizzi, the Director of External Affairs. I look forward, we look forward, as well as all the millions of Italian Americans, to celebrating what will be the Giovanni da Verrazzano Day. Thank you again, uh, Councilman Carr, for your initiative, and we support you 100%. Thank you for giving me the opportunity again. Thank you for your testimony. Angelo, you may begin when the sergeant starts your clock. Time is starting, you may begin. Thank you, thank you for this great opportunity to speak to this council. I, I must uh, start, uh, take some time to first say, how I am as a proud New Yorker to congratulate all those who spoke before me in reference to the arts. Uh, it is the heartthrob of New York City and it would make New York City great. And I congratulate them and thank them for, for their efforts. Now, on behalf of the resolution uh, that uh, Councilman uh, Carr has presented, it is, uh, there are over 800,000 Italian Americans in New York City proud Italian-Americans, and we're proud of the fact that uh, Giovanni da Verrazzano uh, is celebrating, we're celebrating uh, on the 17th of April, the 500th anniversary of his exploration of the New York Harbor, actually 80 years before Hudson discovered the area. So we are looking forward uh, to the approval of this resolution because we think that this is most deserving. I uh, hope that uh, everyone looks positively on this and, and at the end uh, grants this resolution to go into effect. So I thank you for your time and uh, I, uh, I, I once again congratulate those who spoke before me. I really was very impressed with everyone's testimony. Thank you for your testimony. John, you may begin when the sergeant starts your clock. Time is, time is starting, you may begin. Good morning, Chairman, Council Members, and everyone on the call. My name is John Gabriel Jr., and I am the President of the Columbia Association of the Department of Sanitation. My organization was founded in 1936 and is primarily made up of Italian Americans from around New York City that mostly work for DSNY or have since retired. I am happy to be here today to reiterate our support for the resolution recognizing Giovanni de Verrazzano annually on April, on April 17th. I would like to thank Council Member David Carr for bringing this resolution forward through the Council and thank all of you for being here today. Our Italian culture here in New York City remains vibrant and in our culture we continuously recognize those that came before us and who have paved our way. Giovanni, Giovanni de Verrazzano certainly has contributed to New York City's history as the first European to set sail into New York Harbor. And recognizing this history is important for our future generations. For me, as a fourth generation American of Italian descent, I live in Staten Island and I work in Brooklyn. Verrazano was a common name I've heard my entire life. And daily I drive over the Verrazano Bridge and I'm reminded of the work that Italians contributed to our city, whether that be the explorer who pulled into New York Harbor 500 years ago or those who have worked and work throughout our city. And speaking here today, I am proud to share that my late grandfather 
Salvatore Gabriel was a carpenter and spent time on the construction of the Verrazano Bridge, which he was proud of, as Italians are always proud of what they do. And he has left my family with cherished memories and photos of his work. In closing, personally and on behalf of the DSNY Columbia Association, we support this resolution and your consideration. Again, I would like to thank Council Member David Carr and those on this call for their support of Giovanni de Verrazano. I look forward to April 17th to commemorate the 500 year anniversary and recognizing Giovanni annually. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I just wanna thank uh, John, Joe, and Angelo for testifying today. Um, these are three great leaders of Italian Americans and Italian American affiliated institutions and I so much appreciate their support and speaking on behalf of so many of us for whom Giovanni de Verrazano uh, is an important figure and the naming of the bridge across the Narrows was a touchstone moment for, for all of us as a community and, and why I'm so looking forward to celebrating this milestone anniversary uh, this coming month. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes our remote testimony. I'll just do a last call for those who registered to testify via Zoom but don't appear to be online. S. Amir Elivert and Nikori Rodriguez. Okay, seeing no one else, I would like to note that written testimony, which will be reviewed in full by committee staff, may be submitted to the record up to 72 hours after the close of this hearing by emailing it to testimony at council.nyc.gov, and I will turn it back to the chair for closing statements. Thank you to uh, the panel that appeared virtually and for your testimony in support of the resolution, and of course, to everyone who joined us today and to the staff for making it happen. Uh, with that, uh, we conclude our committee hearing. Thank you.